QBH Public School and Melbourne Collegiate, the University of Toronto. So I'm familiar with Toronto. It's really nice to be back here after 30 plus years. Post secondary is like really different than K to 12, like really different. But there are a lot of crossover synergies that I think are entirely possible. And one of the reasons that Lena Patterson, who's our operations director at eCampus Ontario and I are here, is really to find out where those synergies lie and to kind of capitalize on some of them as much as possible. Because the people who come out of that K-12 system are the entrance into our post-secondary system and they bring with them new knowledge and new ways of doing things that are often unfamiliar to our post-secondary educators who are really not struggling, actually are very keen to find out how to use technology-enabled tools effectively in their classrooms. I want to start uh, just by saying who I am. Um, my Twitter handle is here. Uh, be fair. But I also want to start by acknowledging the traditional territory on which this meeting takes place today. Um, for thousands of years, it's been the traditional land of the Huron Wendat, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of Pettit River. Today, this meeting place is home to many indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we're grateful to have the opportunity to work. I want to talk about rethinking, and it's the whole notion of what we do and the reasons we do what we do and why we might want to consider rethinking the ways in which we teach and learn, the resources we provide for students, and the ways we recognize learning. The world is changing, and it's changing really fast, and it's really important that we consider new opportunities and experiment with them actively. Uh, the notion of continuing to do the same thing over and over without really breaking out of the box, to me, is not a good place to be. And I think many of the technologies that we use have actually pushed us into that box. They are managed environments. They are environments that actually don't allow us to be as creative as we might be. And I think that is a central message. All of the slides for this presentation are available at that URL, tiny.cc, learn 17 if you download the whole deck. They're all there. It's a big deck, and so, uh, it's kind of fat when you download it. For the longest time, the rhythm of the academy kind of looked like this. It's a lot of things happening in a very steady pace over time. But I would say over the last 10 years, it's really picked up. And the issue is, is how, do how do we capitalize on emerging opportunities, opportunities that are in front of us? And how do we make those responsive adjustments that really help us to do better learning experiences for students? And what does that look like in the K-12 sector? I know what it looks like in the post-sec sector. So I'd really like you to think about everything that I say, maybe coming from my sector of work, but I'd like you to think about the analog to the K-12 sector and how that might look for you. At eCampus Ontario, we're trying to deal with the thousands of Ontarians who are looking for access to a leg up educationally. There are either people in the workforce currently who want to improve their lot and be better paid, better situated, better organized for a career trajectory. There are students who find that they can't afford to go to school full time, it's too expensive. It's for students who also work at the same time as they learn. And we've begun to organize with our 45 universities and colleges, 17,000 courses online that are offered in Ontario, almost 700 programs that are available fully online in the post-secondary sector. It's a ginormous number, bigger than anywhere probably in North America organized in that fashion. It's huge. Go on to our website anytime and do a search and you will see that it goes deep. Try some of the filters and you can move it out even further. 
currently there is no good data on online learning in Canada. And this year is the first year that post-secondary institutions across this country have cooperated on an online learning survey that attempts to dig deeply into finding out what's going on in campuses, what kinds of programs people are offering, what kinds of strategies and techniques they're dealing with, and what kind of effect it's having on students. And the early data has just come in. It's increasing. People are busting out of the learning management system and trying other tools, actively trying other tools. No longer wanting to be constrained by a managed environment, they're trying new things. Meeting student expectations is the key driver in the post-secondary sector. Students in post-secondary vote with their feet. You offer a crappy course online, they tell all their friends. Enrollments plummet. You have to be doing good stuff to survive. Lack of strategy and issues related to quality are looming issues in the online learning space. Just because we have the capability to do it doesn't mean we're good at it. We have to get a lot better. We have to begin to set standards. We have to start to think about what the value propositions are that we want to offer. Our organization has four pillars in its current strategies. Support students, give them a good experience. Support faculty, help them to give students a good experience. Enhance our members' capability to offer good programs and services online. And build an organization that is responsive to emergent opportunities and can offer innovative solutions. One of the things that's driving us is the notion of everything we do needs to be an upskilling experience, not a de-skilling experience. It's about giving faculty and instructors great tools to take the ideas they have in their mind and make them happen in that online space. It's about upskilling. To do that, we need to think about the nature of what online learning means in today's environment. Technology and learning are forever intertwined now. They're not separate, they're intertwined. And everything we do is kind of an infinite loop of idea, test, evaluate, refine, talk to students, and repeat that cycle many, many times. This requires a whole new brand of educator. And the metaphor we're using is the anatomy of a 21st century learner, or educators, right? To be an educator in the 21st century means you have to have six core attributes. Yep, you have to be a teacher. But you have to be a teacher for learning. And one of the ways to achieve that is to also be a scholar, to actively evaluate what happens in your classroom or your course all the time and be public about the results of that scholarship. That's what scholarship is about. It's not about holding that information tight, but telling others so they can benefit from it. More and more resources are becoming available because of the net. So you have to become a curator. You have to make great decisions about the resources you use. And one of the ways to do that is also to be an active collaborator to build a personal learning network of peers at the scholar level to make that happen. And of course, you have to be a technologist to pull that off. But it doesn't mean a technologist who's offering a steady stream of content, a technologist who's also an experimenter, who's willing to try new stuff. Things may break. Things may not work perfectly but we have to be actively doing this. This is the basis for a professional learning program we're offering to post-secondary educators. Six three-hour online modules to start ramping up your thoughts in this area. It's openly licensed for Creative Commons. You can download it today from our website and use it. We're packaging up the, the training program. It's WordPress-based. 
we can just unpack it and use it. These are actually badges. We're going to badge people's work in that environment so that we actually know what the competencies are associated with an experimenter, a scholar, and that people can actively begin to build in that direction. That's how we're thinking about 21st century educators. So for us, rethinking is something that we think should be at the core of professional practice in the 21st century. It's not enough to keep doing the same old every day. Bust it wide open. Not 100% of the time, but maybe 20% of the time. We worked with our board of directors last September. I arrived here on September 12th, and we were board meeting on September 13th. It was like a strategy session. It was like, oh my God. And we worked with Ken Steele from Education, who's a real futurist and serious thinker in the post secondary space. And we focused on three themes for 2016 17 rethinking learning resources, rethinking the learning experience, rethinking recognition of learning. And these are the kind of programmatic elements that have guided our practice and all of the things we funded and programmatic things that we've done over the past year. The key to the rethinking learning resources for us is asking a question. What happens when we bring teaching and learning into the open? What happens when we reveal practice, reveal resources, and share them amongst our colleagues. How's that gonna work? Well, it's nothing new. In the university sphere across the US, high enrollment first and second year courses are now offering free and open textbooks. Things that used to cost 300 bucks when you went to university cost zero. You can print them for $50, you can put them on your tablet. It really lowered the cost for students. But more than anything else, it has empowered faculty and instructors to take those resources and break them open and add value to them, reorder them, do other stuff to them, localize them, use case studies that work in that environment. Books like Anatomy and Physiology, hugely popular because they're low cost, they're open, and are completely malleable for instructors. It's all based on a simple principle. If you own copyright, you can decide how people can use your work. If you decide you wanna share it, Creative Commons gives you a licensing mechanism that allows you to do it easily. It's simple, standardized way to grant permission for creative work. And it's wildly popular in the post-secondary space. So my question for you would be, why wouldn't a math program that's used in every school in the province have free and open textbooks? Why wouldn't that be a good idea? A whole country of Poland has just done that recently. Why can't we do interesting things like that? <laughs> the symbol for this is called CCC, Some Rights Reserved. And it's starting to take off everywhere, especially in thematic areas. The health profession is a really good idea. So a lot of health professionals building resources at our universities and colleges that they're sharing with their colleagues, making it easy to find the resource, making the resource easy to use. Same thing is happening in K-12 and other jurisdictions. This is OER Commons out of California all kinds of subject level, topic level resources available completely for free, completely malleable, completely open for use, reuse, remixing, redistribution, whatever you wanna do with them. It's a good idea. It's all based on five enablers, a set of principles that say, and this is how it actually works. If you wanna use something openly, the simple way to think about it is that you have five rights. 
to retain, reuse, revise, remix, and redistribute. And the licenses are created with little bugs that you put on the work that tells people automatically, Chris, what you can do with it. Do anything you want with it in some cases. But cite us because we're the authors. The big idea around openness is about giving instructional resources expanded power to help enable teaching and learning, going well beyond free and low cost. And the first benefit is full legal control. Customize, localize, personalize, update, translate, remix. These are important opportunities for you to make something yours, more local, more relevant to your students. We've been working with student government in Ontario to talk about these ideas and principles. And you can imagine student government leaders think this is a cool idea. Because A, they have more money to start the, the year. In many cases, up to a thousand bucks. That's significant. Huge savings to them. But they also see the advantages of creating libraries of redistributable content that they can work with their colleagues on, and that their faculty members are thinking about them, about the advocacy needed to push this forward. We just launched an open textbook library here in Ontario, 180 open textbooks for the highest enrolled first and second year courses. That happened because students went to government and said, this is happening in British Columbia, this is happening in the state of New York, this is happening in the state of California, why isn't it happening here? When students go to government, government listens. We've also been working with faculty because we know that the gateway to the classrooms and the resources that are chosen, particularly in the post-secondary sector, are those that are chosen by faculty. There's a principle called academic freedom, which means that a faculty member can make the decision about what resource is used in the classroom. And many of the key advocates in the open education community are faculty members who believe that freedom, that academic freedom, is really the empowering mechanism. And speak to their colleagues about it. Some simple illustrations. At the University of British Columbia in 2015, they decided to go with a free and open physics textbook, and they saved students 90,000 bucks the first time they did it. The next year, the math department said, we can do better. And they went with free and open textbooks for math for the first year and saved students a million bucks. Following year, they decided nearly every UBC math textbook will be free and open. Think about how much more money would be available to the system here in K-12 if we weren't expending billions on textbook or other print-based resources that could be used in other ways. It's an interesting concept. It's already starting to happen in the US. This was announced yesterday, August 24th, 2017. A free and open math curriculum for grades six to eight. Completely available now for download and use. Everything from student materials, teacher materials, lesson specific supports, strategies for students with disabilities, family resources, all that stuff. You're starting to see a shift in the publishing industry away from widgets, content like textbooks, towards services. And you're starting to see more and more of these kinds of resources becoming open, available, and reusable, and it will continue. I used to go to Sam the Record Man and a and Sound and places like that. They don't exist anymore. Same thing is coming to the educational publishing industry, and our publisher colleagues know this. And they've already shifted upstream into software and services, which is a way better place to be and makes more sense for them. Who writes those textbooks in the first place? Teachers, faculty members, and instructors. The business model is changing. 
In some parts of the US, they're advertising textbook free degrees as a way to market and attract students, particularly in college programs. We're about to launch something similar here in Ontario. Province of British Columbia has already started. They're already calling for proposals in the college sector to take this forward. So it's more than just a good deal, much more. Lots of research starting to happen. Access to customized resources improves learning. You can imagine that when you use examples from your local community, learning improves. Lots of data starting to arrive that backs that up from side-by-side -side tests in academic journals. Authentic learning activities. Think about this one. And what's the analog in K-12? This is ChemWiki, the most popular chemistry textbook on the net co-developed with students at the University of California, Davis. Students write the articles, update the articles on a yearly basis, it's like Wikipedia. And so that's how they generate collaborative ways of generating ideas and content. The University of British Columbia does the same for its soil science courses. They even produced an app for students to collect data, an open source app across the country and feed it back into the database. People are thinking outside the box. This is called the faculty, Open Faculty Patchbook from my buddy Terry Green at uh, Fleming College here in Ontario. They're giving these out to new faculty as they come in the door at Fleming College today. It's like, here's a catalog of ideas that your colleagues have created that are gonna help you move ahead in the academy. Cool ideas for teaching, Great ideas for assessment, neat ideas for collaborative projects for students. This is what that culture begins to breed. My buddy Marina Roberts at Rocky View in Alberta sent me this from her K-12 school district. She's working on a concept called open pop-ups. That is a, a library of like pop-up stores, but they're actually projects that you pop up with your students out of this library whenever the opportunity arises. Things you can do that encourage networking, students talking to one another, students talking to students in other classes and schools, encouraging risk taking, building a culture of sharing. Cool idea. Collegial collaboration is the other big output. We find it in post-secondary when we begin to do stuff in the open, librarians wanna to work together to build shared resources collections of open resources that make sense for biology 101 or geography 102. When you put a bunch of faculty in a room for a week and call it a textbook sprint and give them all the resources they need, they can produce something that is of value to their students. This is the notion of the sprint. It comes from Google's design sprint idea how they build code crash agile process test bank sprints two days 17 site faculty six institutions 850 exam questions these are the kinds of strategies that are becoming popular among people who traditionally kept everything to themselves in academia they're starting to change their practice. And the big one is giving it away, demonstrating the service mission of the institution. It began with MOOCs, and that's pretty good. But how about MOOCs with actual credit? Take the MOOC, get a university credit. OERU yep. provides world class education to everyone, no matter where they live or their background. OERU provides free online courses and affordable ways to gain academic Like that New Zealand accent? Yeah. <laughs> this is a project that emanates from New Zealand, but has universities in New Zealand, Australia, South Africa, the UK, uh, the United States, and Canada working together to launch this year a free first year program for university students that will be no cost. The only cost is if you want accreditation, you pay for assessment. 
people are thinking about different business models. New business models are starting to emerge. To make all of this work, we've had to think hard about how we build the infrastructure here in Ontario for this. And we've been working most recently with uh, Ryerson to build something out. But one of the reasons we're starting to be successful is we have an extremely supportive cabinet minister in Ontario, Deb Massey, who when first this was first explained to her, understood it in a heartbeat and said, I want to support this. And by working with our political allies, we've been able to pull off a pretty interesting program that's well supported by students and is getting much more support across the country. Even governments advertising your wallet is heavier, your backpack is lighter. They're starting to get it, even in the language of metaphor. This is our open textbook library here in Ontario. You can go in right now, openlibrary.ecampusontario.ca. You find an open textbook. Your faculty member, you can adopt it for your classroom. If you want to adapt it, we'll work with you to show you how to do that. That's the library. Ryerson is putting together a complete publishing infrastructure so that any faculty member of the province can sign in load up an open textbook, start customizing it, output it for mobile devices, output it for print, however you want to do it. Building the infrastructure for tomorrow. But it's well beyond textbooks, project files, learning activities, assessments, homework help, PowerPoint decks. These are all part of the build out process. Our position on this is, if curricular materials are funded by government, they should be free and open. The taxpayers have already paid for them. Make them open, make them redistributable, make them accessible. Two more little rethinkings. One of the rethinkings that we've been doing, we've talked a lot to students, is the notion of engagement for online learning and students are not silent on what works and what sucks and so we ran a student design experience studio last january we brought students in from the universities and colleges around the province and asked them to think about problems of online learning and how we could do it better for them and we use the sort of IDEO design methodology to work them through a whole bunch of ideation and paper prototype building to really get a handle on how can we do this better? How can we make a better learning experience online? And the simple idea was this. Our post-secondary students are the recipients of online learning. Why wouldn't we ask them what works for them? Why would we think we knew best. Why wouldn't we engage them cooperatively in the project? In March, we took the next step and invited them to Mars um, design environment, college and university, and paired them up with vendors to talk about some of the ideas that they were thinking about with respect to engagement. And Labster, which is a simulation company out of Denmark, uh, was one of the, we'll put up our hand, we want to be a part of this, working with students to come up with new design ideas for how simulated 3D, VR, and AR environments could be built. A lot of students were interested in getting hired, the experience gap. How do we get hired once we get out of university and college? Our vendor partner, Ripen, from Vancouver, but also based here in Toronto, put up their hand. They have an environment for managing practicums for students out there in industry. It's a free triangular environment. Students, faculty, industry. Faculty-based projects are designed, shopped to industry. Industry says, I'd like two or three students to work on that project. Students do the project. 
students complete the project, assessment is made back. It's a curricular activity, not an add-on. Really interesting model. Students were trying to work with Ripen to figure out uh, a kind of eBay for experiential learning that they might try to launch here in Ontario. Bunch of students from the north who said, we have terrible accessibility, terrible opportunities for learning in many cases, not because our population centers don't have universities and colleges that are excellent, but once you get beyond Thunder Bay or Sudbury or Sault Ste. Marie or North Bay, stuff gets harder to do. And so they wanted to work with us to think with our vendor partner, Orion, the network specialist for the province, how could we improve the connectivity and the opportunity and bring some equity to online learning across the province? So we've been working with our institutions to build a sandbox opportunity for faculty, instructors, and students to try and out some of these ideas. And extend the thing that I told you about, the program of study for faculty members, the 21st century educator faculty model, is really one of those opportunities. It's a capacity building initiative. It's based on the simple belief that if we're going to use technology, it better have an impact on learning. So how do we help our faculty understand how to get the most impact out of the technologies they use? We're trying to be extending their knowledge. This model put together in an online delivery format. Our mantra is really simple. When working with faculty, we're trying to encourage them to explore, be more exploratory more experimental. When you find something, engage with it and do it for a while. When you think it's working, extend it into your classroom. We're really shooting to empower faculty to have the best possible experience they have, can have, because what we're really looking for is enlightened faculty going forward. A whole bunch of Buddhas who get it and know how to use technology effectively. That's our goal. So if you go to extend.ecampusontario.ca, you get a sense of it. Not only do they do these six three-hour modules, they build their own domain. We force them to have their own domain, their own place on the internet. Not some closed portfolio in a managed system, an open portfolio to manage for themselves. Different way of thinking. It's all Creative Commons licensed, free to use. Finally, the other rethinking we're doing is rethinking recognition of learning. We know that the students in our province coming out of high school, coming into post secondary, are ready to learn and have deep domain knowledge in front of them. They're going to learn to be a biologist or an engineer or an accountant or a nurse. But the part that's harder for them to learn is the part that we're calling the T-shaped student. They're really good at deep learning, but the stuff that gets them hired, the stuff that makes them a valuable colleague, the stuff that makes them a good team member, are the cross-domain skills and attitudes that they also need to learn. And so the question is, how do we do that while they're in high school? How do we do that while they're in university? And our minister has said, every undergraduate student in Ontario shall have a meaningful experiential learning opportunity while they're in post-secondary. There's probably only 10,000 co-op placements possible maybe 5,000 internships. So the only solution to get the rest of those is some technology-enabled solution. How do we build that? That's a big challenge which we're working on right now. We know that the private sector has some very cool ideas in this area. This is Red Academy's website. They're a coding academy. They're 
there are four right here in Toronto. They're already talking about redefining education. Take a 10 week program, we'll get you hired. The question is, why wouldn't our colleges step up and try to match that? Right? It's set a pattern that's new and challenging. We should be able to think creatively about ways we can match that. Even people who are already in the workforce, they're getting pinged by Autodesk and all kinds of others to say, nano degree. Don't have time to take a full degree program? Take a nano degree. Small pieces that ladder together into a big piece. Universities are starting to get their heads around that notion of micro credentialing. One of the missing components in Canada, it has a lot to do with the fact that we are a confederation, not a republic, not a single education system for the whole country, but education systems everywhere. We have a really hard time talking about competency and what people can do and how we assess those can-do skills. Yes, we know they got a great grade in calculus, but what can they do with that? We are really bad at that. The Europeans are way ahead of us, and we're going to have to catch up and begin to figure out not how we match jobs to people, but how we match people with skills to jobs. It's that skill match piece that we're missing. Our universities are already thinking about it. Practical Guide to Work Integrated Learning, Higher Education Quality Council of Ontario, bringing life to learning at Ontario University. Our universities know they have a problem. They're trying to figure out how to deal with it. So the call to action here in Ontario is if we're building the workforce tomorrow, what are the implications for learning resources to support that? The experiences that students have, and the way that we recognize their learning. And that's the challenge for us at eCampus Ontario. How do we drive growth and innovation? How do we pay attention to the actual needs beyond the institution? And how do we help our institutions to leverage technology in a way that their graduates come out with what we're calling the 3D CV? Not just deep domain knowledge, but transversal skills that run through that that say, I know about teamwork, I can present, I'm a great public speaker, I'm ethical, I know a lot of stuff beyond the domain knowledge that guides me. And so we're playing around with ideas like badging systems, shaping experiences with industry and students, and very soon, every student Registered in Ontario's universities and colleges, every faculty member, every instructor will have access to LinkedIn Learning's lynda.com soft skills video training programs, we think, by January 2018. We're just currently negotiating the contract with LinkedIn. So that's a big buy. And that's a new way of thinking about just in time learning. I was on there the other night. Because I'm skeptical of some of these things. And I've been teaching instructional design. And I watched their 20 minute instructional design overview. It's a mind blower. It's like, this is really good. So we need to pay more attention to things that are coming to us from the private sector as well. Those publishers that have gone into media and services. Interesting place to be. That's it for me. I hope I didn't scare the bejesus out of you, but we are trying really hard here in Ontario to think differently about how we enable faculty and instructors to make them feel empowered to use technology to shoot their vision of how to work with students effectively. That's what it's about. So happy to answer your questions.